Good evening and welcome to tonight's event, the sixth and final lecture uh, of the Ayn Rand Institute's 2005 series. Uh, my name is Yaron Brook and I'm the executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute, which is headquartered uh, not far from here in Irvine, California. Uh, as I think many of you know, the, the Institute is a non-for-profit organization and all of our programs are funded by private donations uh, from individuals like you. Uh, we're now actively seeking uh, contributions uh, to fund our next series of talks, the uh, talks for the uh, 2006 Ayn Rand Institute series, which we hope to start in, uh, in January. Now, a, brief, uh, a couple of uh, brief announcements before we begin tonight's lecture. First, you might have noticed we have a bookstore in the back of this room with a selection of Ayn Rand's fiction and nonfiction writings and other books and recordings that are related to tonight's talk. Now, I just have an announcement for students in the audience, and I'm really pleased by the fact that we've got a lot of students in the audience today, so that's, uh, that's great. Um, the Ayn Rand Institute offers a number of programs designed specifically for serious high school and college students. One of these programs is our unique objectivist academic center known as the OEC. Now, the OEC offers uh, systematic graduate and undergraduate level courses in the essentials of objectivism, that's Ayn Rand's philosophy, objective thought, and objective communication. Our courses are offered uh, live, but also by teleconference and on the internet. Uh, local students can take uh, them live in our classroom uh, in Irvine in our, at, at our offices. Uh, these, uh, for students, these courses are free. Uh, we, uh, we give scholarships uh, for students taking these classes. Uh, this is a groundbreaking, it's a fabulous program, and our graduating students have repeatedly told us how valuable uh, it was for them. If you're a student and you're passionate about your own education, uh, please pick up an OAC flyer from the table at the back and sign up for additional information. Get on, on a mailing list. You can also talk to members of our academic staff who are here tonight and any ARI member staff can point out to who's, who's from the academic division. I'd also like uh, to announce that our lecture series will continue next year. I'm assuming uh, some of you will uh, pony up the dough to make that happen. Um, that'll be the fifth year of this series. Uh, please consult the Institute's website for announcements of upcoming lectures uh, for the 2006 events. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Keith Lockage. Dr. Lockage is a resident fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute, where he edits and writes op-eds and teaches in the Objectivist Academic Center. He teaches undergraduate writing and a graduate course on the history of physics. Dr. Lockage has a PhD in physics from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, before joining ARI in 2003, he was assistant editor of The Intellectual Activist and did postdoctoral research in physics. Tonight's lecture is titled Creationism and Camouflage, the Intelligent Design Deception. At the end of the lecture, I'll be joining Dr. Lockage for questions from the audience. If you have a question at that time, please step to the mic. There's a mic right here uh, in the center aisle. Also, I want to mention that by early next week, an audio recording of tonight's lecture and Q&A will be available free of charge for anybody who registers on our website. Uh, the website is www.einran.org. So that'll be available. You can tell your friends. Anybody can go and listen to the lecture and Q&A for free. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Keith Lockage. Okay, good evening, everyone. How's the volume? Can you hear me at the back? Okay. One remarkable feature of the natural world is animal camouflage. When a polar bear stalks seals on the Arctic ice, its white fur helps keep it from being seen by its prey. The stripes on a herd of zebras makes them all blend together, making it difficult for lions to pick out individuals. 
There are insects that resemble sticks or leaves right down to the finest features of fake buds and leaf veins. These adaptations are, of course, the result of a long process of evolution in which these characteristics were built up gradually from among natural variations. Camouflage can be a highly effective survival strategy bestowed by evolution. Like a skilled artist, nature molds her progeny to their surroundings, sometimes with an astounding degree of perfection. The ability to deceive its enemies can, for the species possessing it, make all the difference between survival and extinction. A similar kind of camouflage has resulted from the evolution of a prominent intellectual movement today. Ironically, it's the movement that rejects the theory of evolution. Recent years have seen the emergence of a new species of creationism, a species that has evolved a deceptive facade hiding its true nature. This movement goes by the name of intelligent design, and the camouflage it has adopted is sophisticated enough to afford it a distinct survival advantage in today's world. The intelligent design movement has rapidly become the new face of creationism. Its representatives are present in force at school board meetings and curriculum hearings. Its arguments are cited by state legislators, by congressmen, and even by the president. In today's assault on high school biology standards, intelligent design has replaced creation science as the preferred argument against evolution. What is intelligent design creationism? How does it differ from standard creationism? What arguments does it offer against evolution? To answer these questions, we must look at the evolution of creationism. We must consider the history of the creationist movement and the struggle for survival it has undergone. Like any good field biologist, we must investigate the environmental forces and adaptive pressures that have shaped this peculiar species and try to understand why and how it adopted the deceptive strategy of camouflage as its basic survival mechanism. So why don't we put on our pith helmets and grab our butterfly nets and see if we can track down some specimens. For almost all of human history, men have been creationists of one kind or another. Every culture has some creation myth that tries to explain the natural world and the origins of life by reference to some sort of supernatural creator. All progress in science, since its beginnings in ancient Greece, has begun with the discovery of natural explanations that replaced supernatural belief. Discoveries that explain by means of natural causal laws things previously ascribed to mystical forces and supernatural whims. With the birth of modern science and the achievements of Galileo and Newton, this process took off, and by the end of the 18th century, it had been extended to many areas of physical science. For example, consider the science of geology. Before the Enlightenment, the prevailing view of Earth history was the one set forth in the book of Genesis. God created the world in six days and populated it with living beings, including man. Then in fits of rage over the sins of his disobedient creatures, God periodically visited cataclysms upon the earth, Noah's flood, for example. On this view, all of Earth's major geological features, mountain ranges, canyons, rivers, oceans, these were all shaped by catastrophic events like the great flood of Genesis. Furthermore, all this happened within a time span of about 6,000 years. The Bible states explicitly how long Adam and his descendants lived. A careful study of the Bible's chronology, adding up all these lifespans, reveals the exact year of creation, 4004 BC. To the pre-enlightenment mind, the place to look for knowledge of Earth's history was the Bible. And the history to be found there was a history of miraculous creation and divine retribution. But the Enlightenment brought rational methods to the study of Earth's history. Scientists began actually to study rocks and fossils. They began to classify different types and investigate how different layers of rock were formed. 
Unlike the Bible, the rocks gave no evidence of the catastrophes that God supposedly inflicted. Eventually, scientists began to realize that the Earth could not possibly be just a few thousand years old. They determined the natural processes responsible for raising mountains and carving out canyons. They discovered that Earth's geology was shaped not by supernatural cataclysms occurring over a few thousands of years, but by a uniform process of steady, gradual, natural changes occurring over billions of years. By the middle of the 19th century, the burgeoning science of geology had swept aside the book of Genesis. The rational methods of science were being applied not just to, uh, to wide areas of human knowledge, not just by the advance of geology, but by the growth of scientific knowledge in many fields of study. The field of biology was another area. But in the first half of the 19th century, it was putting up a certain degree of resistance. It was not especially difficult for geologists to dispel the belief, say, that the Swiss Alps were formed by God. But it would prove to be much harder for biologists to dispel the belief that living beings, and man especially, were formed by God. One reason this was so hard is that living organisms are so intricately complex that they seem like they had to have been designed and created by some sort of divine intelligence. Living beings are made up of an enormous complexity of parts and organs that interlock and interact in marvelously complicated ways. At the same time, they're extremely well adapted for survival. Their complex assemblies of interacting parts are not just hodgepodges that serve no purpose. They're more like the well-designed parts of a machine that were engineered and put together for a reason, to aid the survival of the organism. Before the 19th century, no one had any clue how such complex beings could have come to be. If living organisms were not designed and created by God, then they must have arisen naturally by purely physical processes. But what sort of physical process or natural law could produce the complex life forms that we know to exist? The state of almost total ignorance about the origins of life, together with the strong appearance of design, made it seem pretty compelling that living creatures must have been made by a divine creator. This is the argument from design. And at the beginning of the 19th century, it commanded a strong degree of support from leading intellectuals. One of the most famous expressions of the argument from design was the one given by Reverend William Paley in his 1802 book, Natural Theology. Paley argued that if one were to come across a watch lying in a field, one would never dream of thinking it could have just arisen there as a result of purely physical laws. It's too intricately complex and too obviously assembled piece by piece for a definite purpose not to have been designed. Well, the same thing is true of living creatures, argued Paley. An organ like the human eye is easily as intricate and complex as any watch, and the purpose it serves in aiding human survival is vastly more important than a timepiece. If it is so easy for us to conclude that watches are the product of intelligent design, then it should be even easier to conclude that eyes are too. Now, the argument from design is not a valid argument, and not just because of its appeal to the supernatural. It tries to use the fact that one does not know the natural causes responsible for, uh, for life as evidence that there can be no natural cause. Ignorance about the natural world is somehow supposed to serve as evidence of a mystical realm beyond the natural world. Nevertheless, in the first half of the 19th century, the argument still had the power to compel belief. Science lacked a plausible natural explanation for the complex features of living organisms. The belief that, in principle, a natural explanation could one day be found cannot have been very satisfying to 19th century intellectuals, making the design argument attractive, flawed logic or not. What finally did the design argument in was not so much its logical refutation by Enlightenment philosophers, but the discovery of an explanation for the apparent design in biology. In 1859, Charles Darwin published his book, Origin of Species presenting what the design argument claimed could not possibly be found, 
a natural scientific explanation for the complex features of living organism, evolution by natural selection. According to evolution, complex forms of life do not just come into being all at once. They develop through a, a long process of gradual change from much simpler forms of life. The eye, for example, did not just spring into being fully formed with a species of eyeless creatures suddenly giving birth to a generation with perfect eyes. Instead, it developed over a long sequence of stages from something much, much simpler, a primitive patch of light-sensitive cells, perhaps. The causal mechanism driving evolution is natural selection. When living creatures reproduce, their offspring are not exactly identical. Variations occur naturally from one generation to the next. If these variations represent an improvement in the creature's faculties, it will be more likely to survive the fiercely competitive struggle for existence and pass those beneficial variations on to future generations. A creature whose patch of light-sensitive cells has folded slightly into a cup shape will be fitter for survival than his brothers. While their flat patch eyes can only indicate light or dark, the cup-shaped eye can indicate the direction of shadows, which might point out the location of a predator. So the critter with the cup-shaped eye is less likely to be a meal and more likely to be a dad, a dad whose children will also have cup-shaped eyes. Now, if these sorts of small improvements occur generation after generation after generation, it's perfectly natural that after millions of such generations, even an organ as complex as the eye could evolve. The only thing this process requires is a long enough period of time for these tiny incremental variations to build up to major changes. But, as we have just seen, and as Darwin knew very well from his studies of geology, vast spans of time have been available in the history of our planet. Just as natural physical forces acting over billions of years can raise whole mountain ranges and carve out canyons, natural physical processes acting over billions of years can turn primitive one-celled organisms into trilobites and plants and reptiles and eventually into human beings. Evolution by natural selection is as powerful a force of nature as any. And as a theory in biology, it explains why living creatures give such a strong appearance of design, even though they are the product of purely natural physical processes. Taken together, Darwin's biology and the new discoveries in geology represented a one-two punch against religion. The new geology totally did away with the Genesis account of Earth's history, and the new biology did away with the Genesis account of life's origins, the special creation by God of each individual species in essentially their current form. This was a triumph of the ancient Greek outlook, in particular the Aristotelian philosophical outlook, the view of man as a rational animal capable of understanding his world, and the view of the world as a natural causal realm capable of being understood. It was a triumph of reason over faith and of scientific naturalism over the primitive supernaturalism of religion. Not everybody was thrilled about this triumph. The growth of reason and science in the 19th century had put religion on the defensive, and this sparked a backlash among devout religious believers who sought to preserve their faith at all costs. In the first decades of the 20th century, the fundamentalist movement emerged in America, seeking to restore belief in the fundamental tenets of Christianity. The fundamentalists took personally the news that they were not specially created by God, but were descended from a lower order of primates. Perhaps this hit a little too close to home at family gatherings. By the 1920s, the fundamentalist movement had made opposition to evolution one of its primary concerns. Anti-evolutionism, as a movement and as a crusade, was born in the 1920s as an outgrowth of Christian fundamentalism. The movement succeeded in getting laws passed banning the teaching of evolution in a number of southern states. This culminated in the famous Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925 
in which John Scopes was prosecuted and found guilty for teaching evolution in the public high school of Dayton, Tennessee. But while the fundamentalists managed to suppress evolution in southern public schools, they had less success defending religion more broadly against the dominant intellectual voices of American culture. For much of the 20th century, religion was largely discredited as a serious intellectual viewpoint. In the decades following the Scopes trial, Christian fundamentalism withdrew from mainstream culture into its own isolated subculture. And anti-evolutionism persisted there, protected from extinction in a favorable ecological niche. But while fundamentalism retreated into itself and remained mired in its pre-enlightenment thinking, the rest of America continued to evolve. By the 1960s, Evolution had become firmly established as the fundamental integrating principle of biology. 1963 saw the publication of a new series of biology textbooks in which evolution played a central role. These books were quickly adopted by almost half the high schools in America, including schools in southern states with anti-evolution laws still on the books. In 1962, the Supreme Court issued a landmark decision ending prayer in public schools. And in 1968, it finally struck down the embarrassing monkey laws banning the teaching of evolution. America was consolidating a policy of secularism in its public schools to preserve the separation of church and state. Despite their attempt to withdraw from secular culture, the fundamentalists found that very culture encroaching on their local schools and the theory of evolution along with it. These developments prompted them to turn their focus outward once again, to engage with modern culture, and to renew their public efforts to fight evolution. To fight evolution in the public schools, fundamentalists needed a theory of their own that they could promote to teachers and school boards as an alternative to evolution. This challenge was taken up by Henry Morris and John Whitcomb, authors of a 1961 book called The Genesis Flood. Enormously popular among fundamentalists, the Genesis Flood represented the emergence of a new species of anti-evolutionist. One focused not just on denying evolution, but also on upholding a positive account of Earth's history and life's origins. This was the emergence of the creationist movement. Drawing on the earlier work of an obscure fundamentalist writer, Morris and Whitcomb developed a theory called flood geology, based on the notion that Noah's flood was the primary historic event shaping Earth's geology. They focused primarily on geology rather than biology, because in their view, the theory of evolution depends critically on geology. If one could show that the rocks and fossils themselves actually validate the Bible's account of Earth's history, then evolution could not have occurred. For one thing, the billions of years it requires simply would not have been available. According to Morris and Whitcomb, the problem with the standard scientific approach to geology is that it ignores the most important source of knowledge about nature, Holy Scripture. After all, God wrote two books, the Bible and the Book of Nature, and these cannot contradict each other in their view but only one of these two books was given to man as a source of absolute truth. As Morris and Whitcomb put it, quote, the real issue is not the correctness of the interpretation of various details of the geological data, but simply what God has revealed in his word concerning these matters. The very strong and detailed biblical evidences for a recent creation and the worldwide destructive effects of the flood have evidently been neglected as peripheral and inconsequential." Unquote. So, the proper way to scientific research on this view is not to start by scouring nature for facts and data, but to start by scouring the Bible to see what it has to say. Then, after one is armed with divine truth on the subject, then one can go to look at the facts and try to rationalize them into harmony with that truth. Now, if this is your basic approach, you can just imagine the kind of science it's going to produce. Consider the creationist interpretation of the fossil record.
The fossil record is an orderly sequence documenting the evolutionary history of life on Earth. Scientists determine the order of fossils by their locations in the sedimentary rock layers in which they're found. In undisturbed formations, younger rock layers are deposited on top of older ones. So the fossils found higher up are more recent than those found lower down. The result is that there is an orderly pattern to the fossil record. For example, the first fish evolved before the first reptiles. The first reptiles evolved before the first mammals. So if you go down the rock layers backward in time, you're going to stop finding mammal fossils before you stop finding re reptiles. And you're going to stop finding reptiles before you stop finding fossils of fish. The fossil record exhibits an order of succession that is never violated. So how does the theory of flood geology explain this pattern of succession? Well, according to Morris and Whitcomb, fossils are the remains of the creatures drowned by the Great Flood, the unfortunate ones who weren't able to get a ticket onto Noah's Ark. Now this means they all died at once, not separately over billions of years. So the flood geologists have to invoke physical processes that can sort the creatures out into different layers. One process they invoke is a kind of hydrodynamic sorting that has to do with different organisms having different densities. It's roughly related to the reason why all your clothes end up on the side of the washing machine after the spin cycle. In any case, it's not a very plausible explanation. Even less plausible, though, is another explanation they offer. To explain why mammals, for example, are never found at the lowest levels of the fossil record, they argue that mammals have greater mobility than other forms of life. So when the flood began, they were able to flee to the hilltops to escape the rising floodwaters, while smaller, more helpless creatures were killed early on and buried deeply in rapidly depositing sediments Mammals were drowned later and buried higher up. So why are human beings found only at the highest levels of the fossil record? Because they were able to run uphill during the flood. <laughs> now, if this is your explanation for the patterns in the fossil record, you certainly wouldn't expect it to exhibit the perfect ordering that scientists find. Surely there'd be a few slowpoke mammals that didn't make it up the hill. <laughs> but this is not a problem for the creationists because they dispute that perfect ordering anyway. One of the revolutionary discoveries reported in the Genesis Flood was evidence of human and dinosaur footprints found in a riverbed in Texas that were found in the same layer of rock. In other words, you know, that they were contemporaneous. Now, scientists tell us that the dinosaurs died out about 65 million years ago, whereas humans only began to emerge within the last few million years. So evidence of contemporaneous human and dinosaurs would indeed be revolutionary. Unfortunately, although the dinosaur tracks were real, the supposed human tracks turned out to be a figment of the imagination. One critic referred to this absurd claim of human and dinosaur coexistence as the Fred Flintstone version of prehistory. So the science that the creationists came up with was not very impressive. But it was thoroughly grounded in biblical dogma and was therefore a religiously acceptable alternative to atheistic evolution. Armed with flood geology, the creationists renewed their efforts to take back the public schools. Now, they knew that a viewpoint that was explicitly based on the Bible would never be allowed in public school science classes. So they simply took their Genesis-based theory and deleted all references to Genesis. Instead of referring to their position as creationism, they began to refer to it as creation science or scientific creationism. For instance, Henry Morris, one of the authors of the Genesis Flood, wrote a curriculum guide for school teachers called scientific creationism. But he made the guide available in two almost identical versions, a general edition and a public school edition. The general edition included an extensive section on biblical aspects of creationism. And the public school edition, it was literally just the same as the general edition, but with all the biblical material deleted. 
The strategy was to set up creation science as being on an equal footing with what they began to refer to as evolution science. They knew they wouldn't be able to get rid of evolution altogether, so they promoted the idea that creation science and evolution science are simply two competing scientific models, both of which should be taught to public school students in the name of offering a balanced treatment. Throughout the 1970s, creationists fought hard to promote their views to teachers and school boards and to lobby politicians. And these efforts paid off temporarily. In 1981, Arkansas and Louisiana introduced balanced treatment laws requiring that creation science be taught alongside evolution science. Now these laws were both struck down by the courts fairly quickly, but the legal battles over the laws provided the creationists with some valuable lessons. Because these battles had a major effect on the evolution of creationism into intelligent design, it's worth looking at them in a little bit of detail. The Arkansas law was struck down by a federal district court. The trial focused on the question of whether creation science really is science or is just religion pretending to be science. The judge heard extensive testimony from expert witnesses and they made it all too obvious what the answer is to that question. In effect, the creationists had simply taken the Bible and painted the word science on the cover. This worked about as well as the amplifier custom made for the guitarist in the fictional rock group Spinal Tap. He tried to make his amplifier louder by having all the volume controls go to 11 on the premise that this would make it one louder. When asked why he didn't just make 10 louder, he paused in confusion and simply said, but these go to 11. Now the amplifier is not going to get any louder simply by renaming the highest setting 11. And creationism's biblical account of earth history doesn't become non-religious simply by renaming it creation science. Because it is an inherently religious viewpoint, teaching creationism in the public schools is unconstitutional. Specifically, it violates the First Amendment's prohibition on government establishment of religion. The Arkansas judge's ruling was so comprehensive and such a devastating indictment of creation science that the state of Arkansas didn't even bother appealing it. Over in Louisiana, however, the legal battle over Louisiana's balanced treatment law was fought all the way to the Supreme Court. In 1987, the Supreme Court struck down the law. But the trial in the Louisiana case was very different from the Arkansas trial. The Supreme Court did not focus on the scientific status of creation science. There was, there was no testimony from expert witnesses. Instead, it focused narrowly on the question of whether the law had a secular legislative purpose. In other words, it focused only on the motives of the Louisiana politicians who passed the law, on the question of whether their intent in doing so was secular or religious. The court ruled that the Louisiana law violated the First Amendment, but it did so on the grounds that its sole purpose was to advance religion. What the court did not do was acknowledge that creationism inherently advances religion. It left open the question of whether or not creationism by its very nature is an inherently religious viewpoint. In fact, the court almost went out of its way to suggest that there might be scientific evidence supporting creationism and that lawmakers might have a valid secular purpose in requiring it to be taught. Quoting from the court's decision, quote, we do not imply that a legislature could never require that scientific critiques of prevailing scientific theories be taught. Teaching a variety of scientific theories about the origins of humankind to school children might be validly done with the clear secular intent of enhancing the effectiveness of science instruction, unquote. And the variety of scientific theories on the table, I mean, one of them is creationism. In other words, the court ruled that teaching creationism is not necessarily unconstitutional. What made it unconstitutional in the case of Louisiana's law is that the lawmakers were too open about their religious motives in passing the law. Now, this was hardly a victory for science. It left the door wide open for more political action from creationists. All they needed to do was be a little more discreet in their lobbying. The court decisions of the 1980s stopped the creationists temporarily, 
but they made it pretty clear what was needed to continue the creationist crusade. In a word, what was needed was better camouflage. What was needed was a new version of creationism that was much better at hiding its religious basis, a new version of creationism that was not so obviously lifted straight from the pages of the Bible one that would make it easier for politicians to conceal their religious motives in voting to force it on the public schools. Defenders of this new creationism would have to dress it up in more scientific sounding language. They would need to have more impressive academic credentials, use more scientific sounding buzzwords, and do a much better job of downplaying their religious motives. What was needed was a more sophisticated version of creationism, one that could be sold as cutting edge science one that could be defended with philosophical arguments that sound much more intellectual. Enter intelligent design. Soon after the 1987 Supreme Court decision, defenders of evolution found themselves confronting something new. A new species of creationists began to appear on the intellectual landscape. To all appearances, these new opponents of evolution were nothing like the scientific creationists. Flood geology? Nonsense, no serious scientist believes that. A 6,000-year-old Earth? Preposterous. The geological evidence that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old is overwhelming and persuasive. Is Genesis a scientific document? Of course not. We have no commitment to defending a literal interpretation of Genesis or any other sacred text. So why oppose evolution? Well, haven't you heard? Recent exciting discoveries in science have unlocked evidence of intelligent design in nature. You may not know this, but the biology establishment today refuses to entertain any ideas other than Darwin's theory, which explains biological complexity by the meaningless process of natural selection. But recently, a growing number of maverick scientists have begun to question the Darwinian orthodoxy. They've thrown off the blinders of Darwinian dogma and are proposing intelligent design as the best explanation of life's complexity. Okay, end sarcasm. <laughs> After the courtroom defeats of the 1980s, it was pretty clear that if creationism was going to get anywhere, it would need a significant upgrade. New tactics would be necessary to skirt the obstacles blocking earlier species of creationism and to exploit the legal loophole left by the Supreme Court. A new group of creationists, led by Philip Johnson, a Berkeley law professor and born-again Christian, formed a calculated strategy for overcoming these obstacles. One thing they would have to do is relax their commitment to biblical literalism. For Johnson, it was a distraction to crusade for the notion that Genesis is a scientific document and it alienated Christians who don't necessarily hold to a literal interpretation of the Bible. In order to pitch a bigger tent and build a broader base of support, intelligent design creationists would focus on more basic issues. As Johnson says, quote, a creationist is simply a person who believes in the existence of a creator, who brought about the existence of the world and its living inhabitants in furtherance of a purpose. Whether the process of creation took a single week or billions of years is relatively unimportant from a philosophical or theological standpoint. Creation by gradual processes over geological ages may create problems for biblical interpretation, but it creates none for the basic principle of theistic religion." Unquote. So what Johnson and his colleagues are concerned about is the basic principle of theistic religion. So what is that principle according to intelligent design? Quoting Johnson again, quote, my colleagues and I speak of theistic realism as the defining concept of our movement. This means that we affirm that God is objectively real as creator and that the reality of God is tangibly recorded in evidence accessible to science, unquote. For Johnson and his intelligent design colleagues, the details of how or when God created everything are negotiable. These can be tabled for future discussion. But what is not negotiable is the view that God created everything and that God's role in the creation is discernible, that there can be objective scientific evidence for God's involvement in the creation. What creationists need to be focusing on, in Johnson's view, is not superficial issues like whether a stegosaurus would fit onto Noah's Ark, 
but on more basic philosophic issues. The fundamental principle creationists must go after, he argues, is the principle of metaphysical naturalism. So what is metaphysical naturalism? Well, as Johnson describes it, metaphysical naturalism is the doctrine that nature is all there is, and God, therefore, is just a product of the human imagination. To the intelligent design creationists, the problem with modern science is not so much that it contradicts Genesis. The problem is that it rejects the supernatural as such in any form whatsoever. The rejection of the supernatural is, in their view, an unwarranted philosophical bias. Why does science have to be naturalistic, they ask? Isn't that an artificial restriction? Shouldn't scientists follow the facts and evidence wherever they lead without being limited by arbitrary prejudice? What if the scientific evidence actually points to the supernatural? Now, at this point, it's worth pausing to consider just why it is that scientific evidence cannot point to the supernatural, why the very notion of the supernatural is a contradiction and an absurdity. Supernatural means that which is above or beyond nature. But nature is just everything that exists in the universe as viewed from a certain perspective. It is existence regarded as a lawful realm of cause and effect. So there is no such thing as beyond nature. There is no such thing as something that exists beyond existence. There is no such thing as evidence for something that transcends the realm of evidence. As philosopher Leonard Peikoff explains, quote, there is no logic that will lead one from the facts of this world to a realm contradicting them. There is no concept formed by observation of nature that will serve to characterize its antithesis. Inference from the natural can lead only to more of the natural, i.e. to limited, finite entities acting and interacting in accordance with their identities." Unquote. So metaphysical naturalism, far from being some kind of arbitrary prejudice, is a basic fact of reality. And the notion that there can be scientific evidence for the supernatural is simply nonsense. So, intelligent design's attack on metaphysical naturalism is a totally baseless attempt to smuggle in an inherently religious perspective. But the important thing to realize is that this is not an obstacle for the movement. To succeed in advancing their viewpoint in the culture and in the public schools, all that really matters for them is whether or not their arguments seem religious. The earlier creationists had tried to claim that all viewpoints are equally religious, including the viewpoint of modern science. They tried to argue that evolution is just a secular religion that requires just as much faith as creationism. But it wasn't difficult for people to see through this as an obvious rationalization. Coming from people whose whole approach to knowledge is total faith in biblical dogma, the claim that evolution is also faith-based just rings much too hollow. For the intelligent design creationists, the challenge was to find a way to make essentially the same point, but using language that conveys an impression of being less religious and more intellectually sophisticated. The goal here was not to disavow the basic premises of creationism. The goal was to repackage those basic premises in language that would be more acceptable to academics and intellectuals. What the intelligent design creationists crave is simply to win a place at the table in today's universities. Philip Johnson, the Berkeley law professor, explains that his primary goal in writing one of his books was to, quote, legitimate the assertion of a theistic worldview in the secular universities, unquote. As Johnson explains, quote, the first priority for critics of scientific naturalism is to state the critique of naturalism in language that the intellectual community can recognize as legitimate. In the world of the university, it's not legitimate to set up the Bible as an authority against the evidence of scientific observation." Unquote. So the intelligent design creationists would have to couch their defense of the supernatural in less religious sounding language. They would have to learn to talk the academic talk. Instead of saying, Evolution is just an atheistic religion. They would say, evolution rests on an unwarranted a priori commitment to metaphysical naturalism, which sounds a lot more impressive. (laughs) 
So one part of the intelligent design strategy is to take the inherently religious arguments of creationism and dress them up in more scholarly, secular-sounding language, language that would be more palatable to academics and intellectuals. Another part of their strategy is to drop the embarrassing Fred Flintstone science, the science that consisted of things like sending expeditions to Mount Ararat to search for the remains of Noah's Ark, or studying the thermodynamics of the fall of Adam. The intelligent design creationists needed to distance themselves from the laughable nonsense of flood geology and come up with something that seems more scientific. Their solution was basically to revive the old argument from design, to dust it off and dress it up in modern scientific sounding terminology. Instead of talking about the Genesis flood, they began to talk about intelligent design. Intelligent design is the view that certain aspects of nature display evidence of having been designed by some sort of higher intelligence. Just as William Paley claimed to have found evidence of God's handiwork in nature, so too did the intelligent design creationists. To see an example of their basic method of argument, consider the work of one of the scientific all-stars of the intelligent design movement, a biochemistry professor named Michael Behe. In his 1996 book, Darwin's Black Box, Behe claimed to have found evidence of intelligent design at the most basic level of life itself in the biochemistry of living cells. According to Behe, recent discoveries in biochemistry provide clear objective evidence of intelligent design. And the only reason other biochemists don't acknowledge us is that they are blinded by their naturalistic bias. But such biases, says Behe, are an artificial restriction on science and should be rejected. Quoting from the book, quote, the philosophical commitment of some people to the principle that nothing beyond nature exists should not be allowed to interfere with a theory that flows naturally from observable scientific data." Unquote. Okay, did you get that? So Behe has a theory, he claims, that flows naturally from observable data. But if you artificially restrict him to natural causes, if you refuse to let him consider things beyond nature, that will somehow interfere with his theory. So what sort of observable data could he possibly be talking about? Has he found a mitochondrion stamped made in heaven? Was he spoken to by a burning bacterium? Has he witnessed a parting of the red blood cells? Well, apparently not. Remember that the evidence that William Paley cited 200 years ago was not positive evidence for anything, but an argument against a natural cause for the complex features of life. The evidence was simply that he found it impossible to imagine how complex organs like the eye could have come into being if they were not intelligently designed. While the argument offered by Paley's modern heirs is essentially the same, Behe has not presented evidence for any kind of intelligent design. What he has tried to do is argue that recent discoveries in biochemistry have allegedly revealed evidence against evolution. So what sort of evidence is he talking about? Well, we need to look at some of his claims in biochemistry. The cells of living organisms contain an amazing variety of intricate structures, tiny molecular machines that drive the basic processes of life. One example is the bacterial flagellum which is the little tail that whips around, enabling bacteria to move. The flagellum is driven by what could easily be described as a tiny outboard motor. It's made of proteins and powered by ions, but it contains all the essential components of a rotary propeller spinning at 20,000 RPM. Behe claims that complex structures like the flagellum are a powerful challenge to evolution. According to Behe, such structures are not just complex, they are irreducibly complex. Irreducibly complex means that all the parts making up the structure are essential to its function. If you take one little part away, the object won't work at all. Behe's favorite example of irreducible complexity is the mousetrap, just the common household mousetrap. 
A mouse trap is irreducibly complex because all its parts are necessary to catch a mouse. A platform with just a hammer isn't going to do you any good. You also need the spring to power the hammer, the holding bar to keep the hammer extended, and a catch to keep the holding bar in place until a mouse disturbs it. If you take away any one of these parts, you won't have a merely less effective mousetrap that catches fewer mice, you won't have a mousetrap at all. So the mousetrap is irreducibly complex. Now why is this a challenge to evolution? Well, Behe argues that if something is irreducibly complex, it could not possibly have been formed by the incremental steps of natural selection. Natural selection only preserves things that help an organism survive. But the parts that make up the flagellum will not comprise a working motor until every single one of them is in place. You can't start with a few parts and have a less effective motor, then gradually add on more parts and make the motor better and better. Unless you have all the parts in place from the beginning, the motor won't work at all. And if it doesn't work at all, it won't help the bacterium survive and be naturally selected for continued evolution. The only way evolution could produce a flagellum, it seems, is if the whole thing evolved in one step. All the proteins making up the motor's complicated machinery would have to spontaneously assemble in just the right way. And clearly this is impossible. So, argues Behe, the flagellum must be the result of intelligent design. If something in principle could not have evolved naturally, then it must have been crafted by some kind of intelligent agent. Just as William Paley had inferred that God must have made the eye, Behe concludes that an intelligent designer must have made the flagellum. And just as Paley's conclusion was flawed, so too is Behe's. The basic problem is Behe's claim that a motor with a missing part is, by definition, non-functional. The most you can really say about an irreducibly complex motor is that if you remove one of its parts, it won't work as a motor. But notice that Behe is trying to say something much stronger than that. He's trying to say that a motor with a missing part will not have any function at all, of any kind. He ignores the possibility that the parts making up the motor might have been used for some other purpose in the bacteria's evolutionary history. It might be true that a motor with a missing part won't be able to function as a motor, but that doesn't mean the remaining parts can't serve some other useful function. Indeed, you can even take away parts of a mousetrap and still be left with useful objects. This was supposed to be Behe's arch example of irreducible complexity. And yet critics of Behe's work have come up with dozens of examples of useful things you can make out of mousetrap parts. Tie clips, keychains, nutcrackers, fish hooks, and so on. <laughs> it's simply not true that the ancestor of the flagellum has to work as some kind of proto-motor. The proteins making it up could have evolved in stages for other purposes and only later have been co-opted for use in the flagellum. The biological principle here is that nature is opportunistic and often makes systems of incredible complexity out of spare parts evolved for other uses. So in the end, Behe's argument is nothing more than the flawed argument from ignorance, just like Paley's. He tries to use the fact that he doesn't know the evolutionary steps that produce the flagellum as evidence that there cannot have been any such steps. He tries to use ignorance about the natural world as evidence of a designer who transcends nature. Now, this was just one example of the kind of scientific argument that intelligent design creationists make. But the general conclusion applies to all of their so-called science. Their scientific claims are just as empty as their philosophical arguments. But once again, the important thing to realize is that just as with their philosophic arguments, that emptiness is not an obstacle for them. Remember that the goal here is not to learn about nature or to advance scientific knowledge. The goal is to legitimate the assertion of a theistic worldview in the secular universities. To succeed in advancing their viewpoint in the culture and in the public schools, all that really matters for them is whether or not their arguments seem scientific. By dressing up the argument from design with impressive examples from biochemistry and with technical sounding buzzwords like irreducible complexity, 
they can make their viewpoint, that they can make it seem like their viewpoint is based on real cutting edge science, even though it isn't. So this is the intelligent design strategy. They've taken the crude fig leaf camouflage of creation science and adapted it into a highly refined form of intellectual concealment. Intelligent design truly is a more sophisticated species of creationism in camouflage. What is most ominous about intelligent design creationism is that its camouflage strategy is proving to be effective. Intelligent design as a distinct movement is only about a decade old, but its effects are already being felt in the culture. It's making inroads in a number of places. For example, intelligent design is making inroads into the mainstream of conservative culture. Conservatives who would never have supported creationism in its disreputable young earth variety can and happily do support intelligent design. The institutional base of the intelligent design movement is the Discovery Institute in Seattle, which is a well-funded conservative think tank. Now, I don't want to tell you just how well-funded they are because I don't want to see Dr. Brooks' head explode. But suffice it to say, they're very well-funded. Even as prominent and mainstream a conservative publication as Commentary Magazine has published a number of positive articles on intelligent design. And Irving Kristol, one of the leading neocon intellectuals, who has called creationism a pseudoscience that has no place in scientific instruction, has said of intelligent design, quote, I find myself very sympathetic to Philip Johnson's critique of Darwinism, neo-Darwinism, and other naturalistic theories of evolution, unquote. Intelligent design is making inroads into academia. Some advocates of intelligent design, who are fellows of the Discovery Institute, hold academic positions at mainstream secular universities, including such top flight schools as the University of Texas at Austin, UC Berkeley, and even Princeton. Now, given the vacuousness of its science, it shouldn't come as any surprise that peer-reviewed scientific journals have not published anything on intelligent design. But a book on intelligent design has been published by one of the most, most important academic publishers around. Cambridge University Press. Needless to say, you'd never see Cambridge University Press issuing the latest edition of the Genesis Flood. Intelligent design is making inroads into the public schools. On January 18th of this year, school administrators in Dover, Pennsylvania, read a statement on evolution to the students in ninth grade biology. The students were told that evolution is just a theory, not a fact, and in addition, they were also told that intelligent design is an explanation for the origins of life that differs from Darwin's view. A supplementary textbook presenting the intelligent design viewpoint was made available for the students. Now, this sparked a lawsuit that's currently making its way through the courts. You've probably heard about it on the news. But this is a case that school districts across the country are watching very closely. A legal victory for intelligent design could open the floodgates for creationism all over America. Finally, intelligent design is making inroads into the political process. Creationism has been promoted at the state and local levels for decades. Indeed, going all the way back to 1925 with Tennessee's anti-evolution law. But intelligent design creationism has made it all the way to the federal level and has even been endorsed by the president himself. During the debate over the No Child Left Behind Act, Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum introduced a pro-intelligent design amendment. Its language was vague enough to conceal its creationist implications, but that language was taken almost verbatim from a law review article by a group of Discovery Institute fellows. Despite its vagueness, the amendment would have given legislative support for mandating that intelligent design be included in biology curricula. It even managed to dupe a clueless Ted Kennedy who praised the amendment on the Senate floor before anyone could explain to him its creationist implications. Fortunately, the amendment was struck from the final bill that President Bush signed into law.
but only after months of determined lobbying by pro-science groups. So an amendment that would have mandated the teaching of creationism in our nation's schools just narrowly missed being enacted into federal law. And there can be no doubt that further political efforts in this direction are coming in the future. At the dawn of the 20th, 21st century, scientists are advancing human knowledge in ways that were unimaginable even just a few decades ago. New technologies with the power to transform human life and improve our very genetic makeup are just barely within our reach. With these awesome possibilities before us, it's almost hard to believe that we could be threatened today by a movement that seeks to return us to the dark ages. But tragically, that's what we face. After centuries of struggle, the historic trend that saw reasons sweeping religion aside is in grave danger of being totally reversed. And the rational understanding of nature that scientists have painstakingly developed is in danger of being replaced by primitive religious irrationalism. So what is the solution to this development? How can one fight this assault on science and reason? Well, the only way to fight bad, irrational ideas is to offer good, rational ideas in response. So what sort of ideas are typically offered by the defenders of evolution, by the scientists and philosophers of science who are supposedly defending science against the creationists? Well, on narrow scientific issues, the defenders of evolution are generally pretty good. They generally do a decent job of explaining the scientific issues and exposing the emptiness of intelligent design pseudoscience. But the most fundamental principle that intelligent design attacks is the principle of metaphysical naturalism. And when it comes to defending the naturalistic metaphysics on which science crucially rests, generally they fail completely. Let me give you just one typical quotation. This is from Niles Eldridge who is famous as an outspoken defender of evolution and critic of creationism. Eldridge writes, quote, By its own rules, science cannot say anything about the supernatural. Science is restricted by the limitations of the human senses and was, in any case, invented solely to explore the nature of the material universe. It does not rule out the existence of the supernatural. It merely claims that it cannot by its very rules of evidence, study the supernatural, if indeed the supernatural exists." Unquote. Now this is supposed to be an answer to the view that religious supernaturalism is incompatible with science, or sorry, is compatible with science. But obviously it's no answer at all. It's a total capitulation to the view that supernaturalism is compatible with science. In my view, there's only one philosophy that can fully and properly answer the neo-creationist attack on science and reason, and that is Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. Objectivism rejects completely the very notion of the supernatural, and it's the only philosophy that upholds reason and reality with full consistency in all branches of philosophy. It is therefore the only philosophy that can properly answer intelligent design's appeal to the supernatural. So all I have to say in closing is that if you're concerned about the future of science, then I urge you to explore Ayn Rand's ideas. It's crucial that intelligent design's deceptive camouflage strategy be unmasked at the deepest level. And if other defenders of evolution are not up to the task, then perhaps a new species of intellectual is needed. Thank you. take questions. There's a mic here in the middle. First one's always the toughest. But. I was hoping you'd go a little bit further. I was hoping that you would answer what the physicist says. And the physicist says the finger of time points downward. Finger of time doesn't point upward. So what we have in the whole biosphere, in the whole universe, 
is devolution. Now, why don't you address that overwhelming scientific problem and not hide behind this 2,500-year-old, silly, inverted fantasy religion called evolution. It was invented by Anaximander. And... Uh, okay, I think I, I... Got the idea? Yeah, I, I mean, essentially the, what the question comes down to is the claim that uh, the laws of physics require or, or somehow forbid evolution because... Um, well, the way you put it is that what we see is, is devolution. Um, I mean, the idea here is that uh, basically this argument is that uh, the second law of thermodynamics, which is a law that talks about um, the, the uh, tendency of things in nature toward randomness or, or um, disorder, okay? So, if, for example, if you have a coffee cup and, you know, the... Um, as it cools down, the way it cools down is it, it, uh, it heats, the air molecules get um, heated up by the coffee cup and the coffee cup cools down and, and there's an increase in disorder, okay? Now creationists have long argued that, um, that this, this law of nature, this tendency toward disorder somehow makes uh, evolution impossible because what is evolution? Evolution is the spontaneous development of order, of, of complexity. So according to this law of physics, supposedly um, you know, evolution shouldn't be able to occur because this law of nature requires the increase of disorder. Okay. Now what this ignores is that this law of physics uh, Basically what it states is that there's a tendency toward disorder in, in closed physical systems, okay? And, but the problem is that Earth is not a closed physical system. We get uh, huge amounts of, um, I mean, essentially what the, the sun puts out large, huge amounts of disorder and it makes possible localized pockets of increasing order here on Earth, okay? So there's no contradiction between the the this general law of physics that things tend toward disorder and the fact that order can spontaneously arise on Earth. Now, as for the claim that Anaximander invented evolution 2,500 years ago, I mean, it's one thing to, to uh, toss around ideas arbitrarily and make up um, some kind of idea that, that creatures would evolve. Evolution was not a scientific idea until Darwin um, gathered a monumental range of facts and evidence that validated the theory. Uh, you know, so it's simply not true that evolution is, a, is some sort of crazy philosophical idea that's been around for centuries. It's, it's an idea that um, it wasn't until you know, Darwin did his work and spent decades gathering evidence across a wide range of fields, and, and in the decades since then, you know, scientists have, have just amassed even more data, facts and data, validating the theory. Um, so. Isn't that the same as like the, uh, to say that the atomic theory was uh, started with Greece because they had this concept of atom? atom? Right, right, it's, I mean, it, it wasn't until Dalton and the chemists um, of the 18th century, um, <laughs> you know, that you had a real scientific atomic theory. Um, and it's the same idea, the, the idea that the Greeks invented atomism, they had sort of arbitrary philosophic ideas, but they didn't have a scientific theory of atoms. Um, this is on topic, believe it or not, but uh, uh, when I grew up in uh, northern Georgia, I was not aware of the history of education there, since you discussed education extensively. What I found out afterwards, leaving the area and speaking with some other people that were experts in that field, was that that area had been a hotbed for the abolitionist movement and, and for the Underground Railroad prior to the Civil War. However, when the public schools became integrated, or not integrated, that's the wrong word, when they became intellectually integrated such that there was a standard public school system, that public school system began teaching what was then the prevalent scientific belief, which was that blacks were inherently inferior to whites and could not aspire to anything beyond a job of a mechanic or a farm boy. 
And this created the Klan in that area. It became a hotbed of the Klan, where it had been a hotbed of abolitionists before. The reason I bring this up is that, like the State Science Institute with Dr. Robert Stadler, we have an educational system which promotes whatever is the current belief promoted by the state. It could be Lysenkoism, it could be evolution. And as an objectivist, I'm surprised that you didn't at least touch on the problem that the underlying cause of the conflict here is that people are being forced to pay for an institution that will promulgate whatever is the current set of beliefs that the state holds, not theirs necessarily. Okay, well there are a couple of issues there. I'll take up the second one first, the issue of public education. I, I am I'm in complete agreement that you know, the state should not be running the schools and that this is indeed part of the problem. Um, and you know, if, if the creationists were making the argument that you know, it's unfair that uh, they have to pay taxes to support public schools that teach evolution, which they don't agree with, and if, if what they were crusading for was you know, universal private education, then maybe I'd be sympathetic with their viewpoint. But notice that that is not what they're, crea they're crusading for. What they're crusading for is to get their religious viewpoint you know, fo uh, forced on students by the state. So I, I agree that it's, it's a part of the problem is the fact that we have a public education system but even if we didn't, you know, the, you, you still have this crusading religious fundamentalism. Now, as for the first part of the question, the idea that, uh, that um, you know, evolution produced this eugenics movement and this led to all sorts of evils and atrocities, you know, that's true, but you can't, uh, I mean, it's also true that, that the Klan were motivated by religion in thinking that that blacks were inferior and, and that God, you know, put the white man here on earth as a, as a steward of creation and that, and that, you know, it's the white man's responsibility to look after the inferior blacks. I mean, that, that comes just as much out of the religious viewpoint as it does out of anything else. So, um, you know, you can't, you can't blame a, a scientific theory for the misuses that people make of it. And it's still, the fact remains that, you know, uh, that without evolution today, we would be lacking the fundamental principle of biology that sits at the base of all the, all the discoveries that we are, have the potential to make in biotechnology and medicine, et cetera. So. Yeah, l let me just add, I, I, I think that the, the, the point about public edu education is a valid point, but this is not an issue that is limited to the educational space. It's, it's highlighted right now because that is where the debate exists. But this is a issue that goes to the heart of what science is. It, it is an issue that goes to the heart of what, um, what reason is and, you know, the competency of reason. So this is not just an issue about public education, although that's a big deal. But this is also an issue about what science is, and, and I think, uh, I think the, the point uh, Dr. Lokic made at the end of the talk about the fact that scientists are such poor defenders of science makes the urgency of presenting the objectivist view, Ayn Rand's view on what science is and what reason is so much more urgent, not just in the context of education, but in the context of saving science from itself. Yes. I've seen a lot of people, occasionally even very smart people, um, taken in by the claim that evolution is just a theory and that you know, we should certainly be considering alternatives because it's not proven. So how do you answer that and what do you think that you know, we should do to help people understand what it means that evolution is just a theory? Well, okay, so I mean, it's true that, that the, when the word theory is used in general discourse, you know, it, it has the connotation of some sort of hypothesis, you know, speculative idea that's not really proven. You know, you know, a detective will have a couple of theories about how the murder was done, but he's not really sure. Um, so that is true, but the point is, you have to understand that when scientists use the word theory, what it refers to is, is a fundamental integrating principle that 
that um, unites and integrates a vast range of facts and evidence. And something only becomes a theory if it actually serves that function of integrating that vast range of facts and data. So for example, you know, I mean, I mean the atomic theory, the fact that matter is made of atoms is also just a theory. But nobody, but there's no question about its validity. You know, gravity is just a theory. Um, so this idea that evolution is just a theory, not a fact, is simply nonsense. It's, it's as, as validated as any other theory in science. Um, and, I mean, another aspect of this is that it's not true that you can just make something up and call it a theory and say, well, I have a theory too, and that's my theory, and you've got your theory, and so these are two competing theories. The point is, in order for something to be a theory, it has to be grounded in in facts and evidence and has to offer a natural explanation of, of the phenomena. Um, so, you know, you can't just say, well, you know, the creationists have one theory and evolutionists have another theory, so let's get together and talk about the two theories. It's, it's, that's, uh, the creationist and intelligent design arguments do not comprise a scientific theory. And they don't compose a scientific theory because they have no facts that align on their side. They have no evidence that they can point to that suggests any truth to, the, to, the, to their, uh, what would be the alternative, their fantasy. Um, <laughs> on the other side, evolution is a theory. Parts of it are clearly unequivocally proven, as proven as any science is. Some is still, you know, the facts are still being examined. There's still things that we don't know about the mechanics of evolution, and that is being worked on. But you cannot deny the fundamental principles in evolution. Those have been proven. Those have been shown to be true. And again, I, you know, people talk about the theory of gravitation, the theory, the atomic theory. Theory in science means something very different than the common usage of theory, and, and it's a... Uh, it's a misuse of the concept just to call it just a theory. Yes? Uh, for those people whose theology doesn't necessarily rest on a literal, literal interpretation of the first part of Genesis, or those with a religion that doesn't necessarily read the Bible with a literal interpretation in general, what would you tell those people about uh, balancing religion in between being objective and Ayn Rand's spirit of being objective, taking into context religion being m maybe more of uh, a bastion for morals or values over maybe explanations for creation or metaphysical terms. So what do you say to people who say that, okay, I agree with you about science, but don't you need religion in order to have morality, essentially? Um, you know, how do you, have, how do you have standards of good or evil unless you have religion? I mean, that's a good question. Uh, you know, it's not something I could have addressed in the talk because it's a slightly different topic. But... Um, I mean, basically, the answer is that um, you, do not, you do not need religion in order to have morality. And, I mean, in order to understand why, you have to, ask, you have to ask the question, why do we have morality in the first place? Why is there such a thing as morality? And in a nutshell, Ayn Rand's answer is that, um, you know, living creatures face an alternative of life or death. We have, uh, our survival is not guaranteed. And for human beings, um, you know, unlike the lower animals, we don't have an automatic set of behaviors that enable us to act in a way that achieves our survival. So for human beings, we need a science that tells us, you know, what is the right way to act in order to achieve our survival and in order to flourish. And that is, that is what gives rise to the field of morality. Um, ethics is a system of principles that are based on the scientific requirements of human life um, that, that enable us to, you know, to, to achieve our life and achieve happiness. Um, so, you know, if this is the nature of morality, if morality is, a, is a, uh, a science that's objectively needed given the nature of man and his requirements for survival, I mean, in fact, what you see is that it's not even true that religion offers a, a, a real code of morality. Because what, what is religious morality? Basically what it comes down to is, you know, whatever God says is right, is right. It has, it, it has, it's, it's not based on the requirements of human survival. It's not based on any facts about man or about living creatures. Um, 
it's basically, you know, whatever God arbitrarily decides is right, is right. And if he changes his mind, then something else is right. Uh, so it, it doesn't offer any actual principles at all. And, and you're assuming there is a God. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I, I mean, whatever God says, claimed by whom? Uh, that is, who gets to speak to God? Who gets to convey this message? Ultimately, it's somebody made this stuff up and then sells it to us as, uh, as, as a moral code that has nothing to do with human survival, has nothing to do with human life. It has to do with whatever the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, this, this person who's declared himself to be the communicator with the, with the uh, divine has declared to be the morality. So it becomes completely subjective, completely arbitrary, out of nowhere. What Ayn Rand is offering is the first scientific approach to morality, actually looking at the nature of human beings, actually looking at the requirements for human survival in order to come up with the morality. So just more broadly to answer your question, you're asking, well, what do we do if we want to be objective about science, but we still want to be you know, we still want to be religious. We still want to believe in God. And I would argue that you have to carry that. If you carry that objectivity about science to everything in life, which I think you should because I think it's good for you, then you will discover that there is no room for God and there is no room for religion. That religion is out, God is out, because they are completely arbitrary. They, the whole concept of God is meaningless, uh, and it, it, it adds nothing and gives you nothing in life. And to take that same scientific approach, which you want to use in biology and physics and chemistry, and take that scientific approach and apply it to every aspect of your life. Yes. Hi. Um, it seems as though like um, science and religion are very contradictory. And I was just wondering, sorry, it's kind of a personal question, but do you believe in God still? No. <laughs> All right. Still. <laughs> no. I mean, objectivism is, is an atheistic philosophy. The, there's no room for God in objectivism. Yeah, so just, just to further on your point, you're right. Religion and science contradict. They conflict because reason and science contradict and conflict. Reason is based... Reason and religion. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that was tape, too. <laughs> Reason and faith <laughs> contradict, they're in conflict, and the, and the reason is that reason is based on facts, on the observation of facts in reality and the integration of those facts. It is about evidence, it, about, it is about what exists. Faith, by definition, tells us that there is no evidence, there is no facts, there is no something to look at. That's what faith means. It means don't look for evidence. Don't look for facts. It tells you, shut off your reason. Shut off your mind. Shut off your senses. Take it on faith. So faith and reason collide. They're in conflict. They cannot exist. They cannot exist at the same time. So if you believe in reason, if you believe in science, faith and religion are out. And, and that is why Ayn Rand is an atheist. She's an atheist because she takes reality seriously. She takes facts seriously. She takes her mind seriously. She takes the evidence of her senses seriously. Um, I found your critique of the irreducibly complex argument to be um, flawed in that you seem to move backwards from the existence of the motor or the mousetrap or any of those other ex uh, examples that you used and took a piece out and said, these pieces all still serve a purpose separately. And it doesn't seem to me that the argument would be that those pieces within perhaps the motor of the flagellum couldn't serve a purpose separately, but that through the process of evolution, they couldn't come together in one step to become the motor. I mean, even yourself, you said that would be impossible. So I was wondering if you could offer a little bit of a, perhaps a stronger uh, critique of that argument. Uh, well, I mean, I could expand on what I said. I mean, I, I, 
the point is that, I mean, this is, this is one of the main ways in which evolution works, that certain things evolve for certain purposes, and then they, they get modified and co-opted into different organs. I mean, for example, the, uh, the, the, the three little bones in our ear, the anvil, anvil hammer and stirrup, that, that you know, are, are enable us to hear. These were originally, uh, these evolved as parts of the reptilian jawbone. So they were evolved for the purpose of allowing a reptile to open and close its mouth, and over a process of evolution, these you know, morphed and changed and eventually you know, became, got co-opted into you know, use as an, organism for, uh, an organ for hearing. Um, and there's a transitional fossil in which the, the bones were used for both, both as part of the jawbone and for hearing. Um, so, I, I mean, with regard to the flagellum, the point is nobody is saying that the, that the proteins all spontaneously come together. The point is that, um, I mean, the way this works is that individual proteins get, you know, arise and evolve for different purposes in a bacterium. And, you know, so, and they serve some useful function, okay? And then over a long gradual process, you know, different kinds of structures and different things evolve. And, you know, the final step that takes all the various pieces and puts them together into a motor is not some kind of impossibly improbable step. The point is all it takes is, you know, one simple little modification and all these parts can come together to form this working motor. Um, so, I mean, that's my understanding of how, how the argument works. I'm, I'm not sure if that, you know. Um, I guess I just was under the impression from what you originally said that you couldn't have an evolution of a motor that sort of worked or a, a less functioning motor, um, that that wouldn't create an organism or sustain an organism through the process of evolution. Okay. Um, and so, that seems to be contradictory to what you're saying. No, but the point is the parts serve some other function. Yeah, they don't. Let me try as a non-biologist, a okay. non-scientist. Um, imagine the bacteria before, the bacteria is something else, it's not a bacteria, it's something, but it doesn't have a flagellum. It has proteins, all the proteins that are similar to the proteins that are now, that now we observe in the flagellum, but they're doing something else. We don't know exactly what, but they're doing something else. And there is a mutation at some point that causes them to, to come together to form a flagellum. It's an accident. It's an accident, but it works. Hey, now I can move. <laughs> and it gives it a survival advantage. And as a consequence, now the flagellum multiplies through, you know, reproduction. So all the pieces were there because they were there to do other stuff. But now they've all come together because of some act, you know, some um, mutation. And now they serve a different purpose than what they were originally there for, now they serve the purpose of motion. And just Let me also add a, a point that was made in the talk, but I think is really important. I could also say, and I think it's completely legitimate to say to um, the um, intelligent design people, a very, something very simple, and that is, I don't know. The point is that we don't know exactly how everything evolved. We don't. It hasn't been worked out. We don't know what those proteins were before they were the flagellum. The point is that their claim that there is an intelligent designer is completely arbitrary. It's out of nowhere. It's like I tell you that there's a gremlin sitting under your, your chair, and you look under it, and it's not there. And I say, well, it's an invisible gremlin. <laughs> Who's, the burden is on me to prove there's a gremlin under your chair, not on you to disprove it. So if they have a theory on how the flagellum comes together, that is an intelligent designer put it there, well, show us one piece of evidence that that is true. Of course, they can't. They cannot do that. So a lot of times they're going to come up with bizarre theories and we're going to say, well, we need to work, we need, you know, we just don't know. We don't know why the flagellum is there or how it got there. But that's not, that's not, that doesn't mean that evolution's wrong because you don't know something. Uh, and that's the argument for ignorance, because we don't understand. And think about God in general. Think about the um, Egyptian gods. There was a river god, because the Egyptians had no idea where rivers came from and what the whole deal was, and floods and up and down and tides and so on. So there was a river god. And they didn't know where the sun came from, so there was a sun god. Uh, in other words, 
Peoples have always used God to explain what they didn't know. Well, we now have science, and what we know is that we can figure stuff out. We don't need an arbitrary explanation to lump all the unknowables into some concept of God. We just say, we don't know, let's figure it out. Interesting challenge. Let's go and use our reason and our scientific method to figure out, to solve this problem. Interesting problem. Okay. We're not at the level of the Egyptians anymore. We've had the scientific revolution. What the intelligent design people want to do is put us back to the level of the Egyptians. That say, here's a flagellum. So there's a flagellum God, because we can't explain flagellum. <laughs> Yeah, it was a good talk. Um, it's funny because if intelligent design is trying to forward an agenda by uh, putting on a new wrapper and seeming scientific and all pompous and everything, it seems that, uh, and you mentioned this in the talk, that they're trying to move away from the patently ridiculous of literal biblicism and so forth. So in their very move to seem modern and accepted, it's as if they're undermining their, their constituency, their base. So can't they see this? And, you know, it's, it's just going to damage uh, the, the core beliefs that they really have. Because really what they're left with is, again, you know, well, we just have this intelligent designer. Well, again, it's arbitrary. So where do they go from there? And, and well, as an aside, uh, it's funny that the current ID movement, faith-based, essentially, uses government, you know, a corollary to get its agenda, whereas, you know, logic, of course, and freedom need to somehow combine to fight that. So your thoughts? Yeah, I mean... I mean, I think the, the, the idea of the intelligent design strategy is, is that this is going to allow them to appeal to a broader constituency because it was the, it was the old style creationists who appealed only to a narrow, limited, fundamentalist subset. Whereas with, the, with intelligent design, you know, they drop the sort of obviously silly ideas and they can appeal to a broader um, American Christian audience. And, you know, the fact is, I mean, polls consistently show that an overwhelming majority of Americans supports the idea of, of teaching alongside evolution some version of creationism. Now it's not, now you know, for most of them it's not literal, the literal interpretation of the book of Genesis. So the point is, you know, they are, they are trying to appeal to something that's very broad in the culture. And I mean, this is what makes it dangerous. This movement is, you know, just one aspect of a, a very broad and fundamental rise of religion, you know, return to religion in this country. Um, so, you know, they do, they do get flack from the old, old, old style creationists on exactly the grounds you're saying, but it doesn't bother them because they're, those people are marginalized. Well, uh, and also, everybody knows what they mean by an intelligent designer, right? They don't really mean the Martians. You know, they, they, mean, they mean God, and, and the fundamentalists know that, and within their own circles, they whisper that, and everybody, everybody's in agreement that, that that's what they mean. So they get some flack, but I think they get flack from the real, the, you know, the real uh, radicals uh, out there that nobody pays attention. The Pat Robertsons of the world. Well, but yeah. I don't know that Pat Robertson gives them flack, does he? I mean, my, my guess is that Pat Robertson understands that this is a way to expand religion, to, to grow the religious base. Politically, it's very savvy, they consider it. And indeed, they get support from a lot of people who are not Pat Robinson-like, like the neoconservatives, who, uh, Irvin Crystal is Jewish. Uh, many Jewish neoconservatives support uh, intelligent design because they see it as a way of making religion uh, more appealing. It, 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 they're co-opting science. How can you object to it? And even if they don't really believe in it, it's, it's part of their agenda to bring religion into the culture. So it's, uh, it, it, it grows the base. It doesn't reduce yeah, it. And, and what's interesting is that if you look at the, the speeches and the books that they write that are tailored to a Christian audience, 
you get a very different picture of the intelligent design movement. I mean, if you read, you know, they'll write an op-ed for the New York Times and the whole thing will be, well, this is, this is scientific, it's not religious, it's based on science, we have all these scientific arguments. But then, you know, you'll see the same person giving a speech at a church that, you know, it's available on the internet. And the whole thing is, you know, this is, intelligent design is, uh, you know, a way of understanding how God did his work. I mean, it's a completely different, there's a, there's a, completely two-faced nature to the movement depending on who they're talking to and it's it's this attempt to appeal to a broad broader Christian base. And, and really what's sad here is that uh, it's appealing. <laughs> that people that people are, are intrigued by this, that people that, peop that the New York Times gives them space on, on the editorial page to even write about this stuff because it's so it's it's no different than the creationism. It's so silly on its face. Um, I mean, one of the contradictions I, I think Dr. Lockage points out in one of his op-eds is this idea, well, if there's an intelligent designer, then if, if you are insisting that there's this natural intelligent designer, you know, the sequence, then who designed the intelligent designer? If this is complex, imagine what, how complex an intelligent designer is. So who designed, I mean, it, it's ridiculous on its face. Um. There's an article on the ARI website called Sir Isaac Newton, Where Have You Gone? I forget who wrote it, but I've read it many times, and given how absolutely pro-science the ARI is, I was hoping for a clarification on that article, because every time I've read it, it sounds very anti-theory of relativity and anti-quantum mechanics. So since, I mean, there's, you know, limitless science to prove it, and, and you know, satellite technology is based on theory of relativity, and computer chips don't work without quantum mechanics, etc. I was hoping just for a clarification on why that article sounds so let me, let me like anti-scientific. You want to say something? I'll give the simple answer and then you can give. Uh, okay. uh, my we are not against, and, and maybe Dr. Lockage, the physicist will correct me, we are not against the mathematical formulations of quantum mechanics. We are against the philosophical interpretation of those mathematical equations. There's no question that those equations work. As you said, chip technology. What we're against is the interpretation, the philosophical interpretation of those equations, and even the physical interpretation in the sense of the, the physics, the way they explain it, not the actual you know, equations. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the problem with modern science is that its basic methodology has changed from you know, the methodology that Isaac Newton and the great scientists of the 18th and 19th century were employing. I mean, the basic method that's employed today is something called the hypothetico-deductive method. And the basic idea is that, you're, that, that scientific ideas are, are supposedly free creations of the human mind. You can just make up anything you want and then, you know, subject it to, to experimental test. And, you know, if it works, then um, then it's a valid scientific theory. But the point is, this is not the, the way that, that scientific discoveries are actually made and were made historically. The, the ideas, the, I mean, as I said before, in talking about a theory, in order to propose something as a valid scientific idea, you have to, it has to be based on a wide range of facts and evidence that are already available. And, you know, you're not free to just make up, you know, well, I want to make up a mathematical theory that involves, you know, 600 <coughs> dimensions that are, you know, twisting around each other, and that's going to be my scientific theory, and then I'm going to, you know, subject it to a test. Or, I mean, and today it gets to the point where they say, well, it can't even be tested, so we're going to, the standard that we're going to use to judge scientific theory is whether it's beautiful or elegant, and they're comparing physics to poetry. So, you know, it's, uh, the author of that op-ed, by the way, was David Harriman. Um, and his point is that we need to return to the scientific methodology that was pioneered by the, the fathers of science, Galileo, Newton, etc. And we have to get away from this modern idea that science consists of just making anything up and then, as an afterthought, subjecting it to, to experimental test. And I, I essentially agree with what Dr. Brooks said about quantum mechanics and relativity. You know, there's no question that, that these theories capture something right about nature. You know, the global positioning satellite technology wouldn't work without, without relativity. But, but the point is, if you have a, 
If, you, if a scientist comes along and says, I've got this great mathematical theory, and I've proved that there's no such thing as the law of causality. I mean, on the face of it, it it's, simply, you know, it's simply false. How do, how do you prove anything if nature, how do you prove any kind of scientific law if nature doesn't follow natural causal laws? Hi. Uh, my daughter goes to UWM, so that's the first thing I heard when you introduced yourself. Right. Um, as I came to the meeting tonight, I, I thought it was, I've never been to one of these before, but I'd seen the, you know, on MSNBC the other night, actually, I thought it was pretty interesting. <laughs> and, um, but my question is, in terms of intentionality, okay, I, I was a philosophy major years ago, and they, one of the things you say was intentionality, the idea that ideas had sort of a mind of their own and they would spread intentionally, or, or that, um, people, it seems like the, uh, Evolutionary theory, it's, it's sort of like Edison where he said every wrong attempt discarded is another step forward, which is sort of a, a, a reductionistic standpoint, you know, how we got where we are. My question is, in um, objectivism, is there any room for intentionality uh, for even on the molecular or atomic level um, where you're talking about the reductionistic breaking down to its smallest useful forms, basically where, you know, 106 bunch of atoms and stuff all got together, I guess, and decided to bring me here tonight. They all got together against my will and brought me here. <laughs> so here I am standing in front of a microphone. I was wondering if, if, if um, you know, the objectivism accounts for things like intentionality or is that just a fantasy essentially that we want to apply to things to give ourselves more meaning? Okay, so I mean matter, so th there's two aspects to this. The first is that matter does not display intentionality. That matter, you know, obeys uh, deterministic laws and, and does not exhibit some kind of higher teleology or purpose, okay? But it's a directly observable fact that human beings have free will. You know, I ha I, I, it's directly obser observable. I can directly observe that if I want to raise my hand, I can do it, and if I, and if I don't, I don't have to. So, um, so the point is, how, you know, I mean, the question that, that often gets asked is how, how did this come about? If, if nature is, you know, without human consciousness, if nature is materialistic, how, did, how, do, how is it possible that, this, that we have this faculty? But the point is, you know, it's, it's in the history of life on Earth, new kinds of abilities and faculties and capacities evolve all the time. You know, the, at some point in, in evolution, creatures evolved the ability to fly. It's a totally new capacity. They didn't have that capacity before. So uh, at some point in, the, in our evolution from you know, the common ancestor that we share with chimpanzees, we developed a certain kind of mental faculty, the faculty of reason. And, uh, and um, as part of that faculty, we have, the, we have the ability to make choices, that we have, we have free will. And this is a, it's a perfectly natural aspect of human nature. I mean, the standard argument is that you, there's no, that, that you can't have free will unless it's somehow some sort of mystical supernatural element that's imbued into us by God, that nature by itself has to be materialistic and you can only have free will, you know, free will is somehow supernatural. But the point is, it's a perfectly natural faculty, and we and we we perceive directly by introspection that we have the freedom to choose. To yeah, I, I mean, even ideas don't have intentionality. O only people have intentionality to the extent that they can intend something and act. That they have that they have free will. And uh, you know, life is an example. There's no life in just material stuff. Only certain combinations of material stuff have life. Life is a, is a type of thing that doesn't exist in rocks. So uh, there's a completely natural explanation to free will, even if we can't point to the exact um, you know, evolutionary mechanism that brought it about. Exactly. It, it's there, even if we don't understand every aspect of its physical mechanism. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lockich. That was a nice talk. Um, one aspect of the intelligent design movement, or one of their arguments, and I, I know you only had an hour to do this, so, uh, but, um, and I think irreducible complexity is a subset of that, and that's um, um, 
Dembski, William Dembski's um, specified complexity, and he has a, a filter that, uh, if I understand it right, at first look, it, it whole purpose of being that we could detect design. Um, and of course, the objection will come when trying to apply that to a biological system or something like that. But it, I guess the first gate is law, and then the second gate is, um, is it a Random complex, chance. right? Yeah, and then finally, is it independently specifiable? That's one that I haven't heard um, um, a satisfactory answer to yet. And I wanted to know if you might be able to. Um, well, it's difficult Talk to, to give a satisfactory answer because Dembski keeps changing the theory every book he writes, and it's 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 presented in you know this ponderous mathematical jargon where the the definition of what he calls specified complexity never stays the same from book to book. I mean, the point is that it's it it is what I said in the talk is that in essence all of their scientific claims come down to this idea of the argument from ignorance. And this applies to the work of William Dembski as well. It's an attempt, so you, you, say, you say he has this explanatory filter where the idea is you're going to, I mean, basically his idea is that he wants to work out some sort of mathematical procedure that you can apply to some kind of physical system, and he wants to apply it to living organisms, where you can calculate the probability that such an, an entity came about by natural laws or by random chance, and if you know his math mathematical calculation reveals that the probability was too low, then you know the default alternative is design. So it's it, it's it's essentially the same. Just uh, the I thought the next one was independently specifiable. That was the part that the one other part. I've only read one of his things, so I don't. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I don't think it's even worth trying to get into all the, all the details that he presents because the argument essentially comes down to the same argument from ignorance. It's, um, you know, he claim, I have this mathematical calculation that will somehow prove that, you know, natural causes could not have done it, so it must be a supernatural cause. But, I mean, there's no... As I, as I indicated in the talk, there, there is no argument based on, on na facts and observations in the natural world that's going to get you to the supernatural. Look, the, the answer to, if somebody presents you with a whole string of, of uh, things, you know, Dembski says it, it to, to, for this to happen, it must have been one in a gazillion probability and that's impossible. And, okay, so? I mean, that's the only response possible. So one in a gazillion happened, or maybe we're missing something, or maybe we need to look at this a little differently. But the answer is never, ever, ever, therefore I'm going to make up some gremlin somewhere that made this. That's just, that's just nonsense. So when you come up in a situation where you don't understand something, the solution is not to go outside of reality to look for an explanation. The solution is, let's look more closely at reality. Let's look more closely at the facts that we have before us. And let's figure out the problem. So you can always come up with, you can always come up with some statistical methodology, some methodology that shows that based on the facts as we know them today, this would be impossible. So we don't know all the facts. Right, so think, we need to do more science. I think that's the important point. I mean, to do his calculation, he has to assume he has to assume a particular kind of natural law that, that gave rise to the organism. But, and again, what he's trying to do is, as a result of this calculation, is say no natural process could have done it. But how do you rule out natural processes that we might not even have discovered yet? I mean, imagine applying that theory to the early days of physics. I mean, it, it, you just, you go nowhere. And, and indeed, Middle Ages, they went nowhere because uh, you can always attribute, you can attribute everything to God, and that's the simplest thing, and then it's easy. You don't have to do any more science because it's God. But the whole point of science is to keep looking at reality, to keep figuring things out, and every, every day, every year, we learn new things. So it, it, it's, it's a mistake to view Darwin's theory of evolution as the static theory. Okay, we know everything there is ever, that we'll ever know about the theory of evolution, and okay, this set of data can't prove everything we know about, about biology. Well, 
that means that we need to learn more things. And indeed, if you ask any biologist, I'll tell you that every day they learn new things that are added to the body of knowledge that is evolution, that is biology, and therefore you, you keep adding explanatory power to, to the theory. And so it's just, you, it's a waste of time to delve into this to, to, to mathematics. You have to understand the methodology that underlies it, the fundamental philosophical flaw that they're making, and then you can discard all of it. You don't have to disprove every f nonsense that they come up with. Yes. Hi, thank you for your, your talk. Um, I just want to, I guess, assert sort of what, what you were um, asserting. Um, given naturalism, which I think is what you're um, defending, supporting or committing to, um, naturalism and science, if you can call it science, considering sort of um, the causal closure of the physical. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how we can account for things like um, consciousness. I know the gentleman brought that up, but consciousness, um, free will, um, even you touched upon morality. Um, I don't see those, um, these um, natural, naturally found in naturalism. And also, um, if we could give a scientific explanation for that, I don't know if there is um, one that, I don't know if you can offer one, but I don't see those things natural in naturalism at, at all, so. so yeah, I mean, I, I, mean I, I think each of those have been addressed to some level by in previous questions. The point is, part of the problem is that there's, there's traditionally been a false alternative in the history of philosophy. And uh, naturalism has been associated with some kind of pure reductionist materialism which, which rules out the possibility of consciousness, free will. I mean, this is captured by Immanuel Kant's famous phrase, God, freedom, and immortality. The only way you can have free will um, is if it's associated with, with religion, the supernatural, you know, life after death, all this sort of thing. So um, what, the point is that um, it's, Ayn Rand's philosophy is, is the first philosophy that, that uh, provide, that, that brings consciousness and free will and the basis for morality um, into a natural metaphysical worldview. Um, and I, I tried to, so, I mean, I, I've tried to indicate in previous questions how, how it does all these things. I mean, I, that, that the, uh, the nature of our consciousness is something that emerged as part of the evolutionary process. It's a perfectly natural thing. I don't claim that anybody yet knows, you know, the, the, the scientific biological basis for human consciousness. It's a, it's, a, it's a scientific problem that we don't yet have the answer to. But the idea that our, that our minds are not, are somehow not natural, that they, that, I, I mean, you, you know, what do we see? You look out and you see that animals have a certain, some animals have a certain kind of consciousness. Human beings have a particular kind of consciousness. It's a perfectly natural phenomenon. Yeah, I think it's important what, what you mean by natural. Natural is what exists out there. What is part of existence? And consciousness is part of existence. We look out, I think you're all conscious. Uh, animals are conscious. We know that, uh, that Certain animals are conscious. At a certain point, living entities are not conscious. Some living entities have consciousness. Some do not. It's part of existence. It's part of what's out there. Do we have the scientific explanation from how it evolved and what comprises exactly? No. But so what? Naturalism is about what is evident, what we see, what we can prove, what we can show. And we can prove free will. All you have to do is introspect in order to do that. We can prove consciousness. These are things out there in reality. They are material things, tables. They are, there is consciousness. Those are two things that exist in reality. And indeed, consciousness is part of a material being, i.e., human beings, animals. There is no consciousness separate from physical beings, from, from, uh, from human beings. So you've got to get away from this narrow uh, view of naturalism equals strict materialism. It's just not true. Naturalism is the, is the study or the, or, the, or, or, what, or the study of what exists, and that includes consciousness. 
Um, could you just offer a brief definition of consciousness? Well, because it's awareness. It's, it's that it. Because <laughs> you mentioned introspection, and yes. if we assume introspection, you are aware of things. You are aware, aware of this of glass. Yeah. So in order for, that is what I mean, consciousness is. It's the awareness of what it is around us. In 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 objectivism, consciousness is an axiom. It's a it's an irreducible primary. So it's you you look out at the world and you see there is something I am aware of, and contained in that act are. The, or the fact that existence exists, you look out at the world and it's there, and the fact that you are consciousness. It's, it's, a, it's an irreducible primary, it's a, it's a primary act of awareness. Um, so it's not something that you define, it's, 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 it has an ostensive definition. You, it's, it's self-evident that you are aware when you perceive reality. Um, I, I just, just terms that you mentioned, like introspection, that would imply um, self, you know, self-awareness. Yeah. But again, how do you locate that or find that in naturalism? Because I mean, if you, you think about the complexity, by the, by the find it by the fact that you know that you have it. That is, it's part of naturalism. That it's that, that consciousness is there. That self awareness is there. What is there to find? You look out at the natural world, and you are looking out at the natural world. It's contained in the very act of looking is the fact that you are aware. But if you if you hold the view that if the evolution view of the complexity of organisms. Um, I don't see how, this is just something I'm trying to figure out with the mind-body problem. Um, no matter how complex the neurons are, you have a set of neurons, you make it complex and make higher levels of complexity. I don't see how that spits out consciousness. But I just have a hard just time because you don't see that. it. Just because you don't see it, and, and maybe I don't see it in the sense of, I don't understand the, the science of it. It's obviously there though. And the fact that it's there, means that it's part of nature. It's part of existence and therefore is part of naturalism. Now, are people studying the nature of those nuances and, and yes, they're studying them. But it's not, it's not something, it's, it's, we're aware of consciousness. The, the, the fact that we're conscious does not depend on scientifically understanding that we're conscious. We are conscious. And you don't need God in order to explain the fact that we're conscious. All you need is to know that you're conscious. Okay, thank you. I was actually wondering, um, from the idea, first of all, to kind of answer his question as well, um, the idea of uh, <laughs> science, and, and to me it feels like existence exists pretty much is what science follows. Um, the, that concept in itself seems to me like it's, it's the way that we research, the way that we, we try and question things in this world. What is what it is, is what it is. And I think that's more than evident. So just to answer you on that question, it feels to me like that's what it is. Why don't you get to your question? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, so um, well, my question is, it's a very simple one. Just if you can explain maybe how and why as in, why in human behavior we uh, we're attached to this idea of a of a god of uh, of having God being this or or not necessarily God but having um, some kind of uh, uh, of connection uh, to to what molecules do. It just it seems kind of irrelevant to me, and it doesn't feel like there's some people understand necessarily what 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 it is that we're we're, we're trying to say here as uh, as objectivists and uh, maybe there's a false interpretation with what uh, with how we research and how we we try to understand as scientists as objectivists more or less so i'm just i'm questioning the ideas of people and and why they think that why they think yeah, why, why do people why, why, believe in god? why do they cling to the idea of god well yeah I mean, I think Dr. Brooke essentially answered the question with the example of ancient Egypt. God is used to sort of fill in the gaps of ignorance. So, but, you know, our view is that if you, if you don't know something, the most, the rational recourse is to say, we don't know, and it's something we should discover, not, you know, make up fantasies to try to fill in your ignorance. So. And, and, and there are lots of psychological reasons, I'm sure, why people believe in God, but that, that I'll leave to psychologists, whether it's fear of death and they, you know, they want to they hold on. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's, I think it a lot, and the rise of religion today um, has a lot to do with the kind of moral bankruptcy in our, in our culture. That is that there is no secular 
a moral alternative to religion. So people don't want to be nihilists. They don't want to follow kind of the nihilistic uh, path that the left uh, has, uh, has adopted. You know, the, 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 every secular, all the secular moralities out there are bankrupt. And therefore, good people who want to latch on to some kind of moral standard are going towards religion. Unfortunately, what they don't realize is they're going from, you know, from one, uh, from one nothingness to another nothingness. That is, that the, the, the basis for, for, for religion morality is no different than the basis for the nihilistic, you know, pseudo-morality of the left. Um, so there were, a lot of, there were a lot of reasons, you know, educational system, the teachers that doesn't teach kids to think, that, 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 that don't take reason seriously, don't, don't take your mind seriously. And as a consequence, they, they're more emotionalists and they're more driven by faith. Uh, Faith-based ideas appeal to people. So because uh, they've never taught to think, they've never been taught to, 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 to reason, the world to them is one big Mystery. They they don't understand it, and and uh, uh, you know even if it's an arbitrary explanation, <laughs> it's an explanation for them. Well, my question is about camouflage, and I'm still a little shaky about the thought that I might be devolving now, and that I don't have any more good years ahead of me. But uh, <laughs> but uh, 39 years ago, when I was a senior in high school, I was I'm sure I was evolving at that point, and. Uh, my band director gave me Atlas Shrugged as a graduation present. And uh, at the time, I thought it was just because she thought I was a nice fellow, and uh, here's a great novel, and hope you enjoy it. But now, I'm wondering if that wasn't kind of an act of camouflage. I wonder if she wasn't trying to give me, uh, in addition to a really great novel, a, a whole perspective, a whole, uh, particularly uh, a, an ethical way of approaching life. And uh, I, I know you said earlier in the Q&A that uh, Ayn Rand's ethics is a scientific morality. And I'm thinking, well, listen, if, if scientific biology and physics and chemistry are good for the public school students rather than this mystical stuff that they keep trying to bring in, then why not scientific morality? And, and uh, gee, if camouflage is good for the bad guys, then maybe camouflage is something that the good guys ought to look at. And, and in fact, maybe that's what you're doing with the, uh, or, or you could look at what you're doing with the essays contest as a way of bringing, presenting uh, Ayn Rand's morality to, to a whole generation of, of uh, young people that really need an alternative. See, in our schools, we've got, uh, it's a lot easier to keep the mystical ethics out, but the, but the secular stuff, the, the collectivism and the altruism, sure. they, they seem to be perfectly comfortable with that. I don't know why, but, but well, if we, you know, getting Ayn Rand's yeah. morality in there would be a great I mean, thing. I didn't plant this question, but, but since it was asked, <laughs> and I'm not sure there is a question there, but what, um, <clears throat> we're doing more than just the essay contest. Um, I think a, as we speak, or maybe it's a little late, but, but as we speak more broadly, we're in the process of shipping 250,000 copies of Ayn Rand books to high school teachers who are going to be teaching them yes. uh, this coming year. So, you know, that'll put at about half a million students who are reading Ayn Rand this year, uh, thanks, to, thanks to donations from those of you who support the Institute. So yes, we are using whatever camouflage we can. Well, <laughs> no, but I... No, because contained in the idea of camouflage is deception. And so I, I don't think it's fair to characterize our programs as camouflage because <laughs> what are we offering when we offer English teachers a, you know, a classroom set of Ayn Rand's novels to teach in their class? We're offering them Ayn Rand's novels, which are of value. English teachers across the country are, are, love, are desperate to have this novel because it's such a great work of literature. They want to teach them in their classroom, and that's what we're offering them. You know, the idea that we're somehow, you know, hiding a philosophy in presenting this, I mean, you know, I, I'm sure that's, you know, you were maybe a little tongue-in-cheek in saying that, but, but I... I, I uh, we're providing them with great novels that happen to have the ideas we want them to have in them. <laughs> <laughs> Objective design. Yes, I wanted to clarify something for myself. Uh, you seem to be saying towards the end of your lecture that it is Ayn Rand's position that there definitely is no God. And I thought it was more her position that um, 
it is, it, it doesn't matter that if there is a God or there isn't a God because nobody should have to prove a negative, nobody should have to prove that there is no God, it is the responsibility of the party who makes a claim to prove that um, it is true. So is it her position that there definitely is no God or? Well, I mean, so objectivism is an atheistic philosophy, but what does atheism mean? Atheism is not the position there is no God. Atheism is the view that I am without belief in God. I don't, you know, believe in things for which there are no facts and evidence. So the point is, I mean, objectivism is our, our primary orientation is not against religion or against the idea of God. The, our, the, the, our, our rejection of the concept of God and our rejection of religion is a consequence of a positive focus on an, an affirmation of reason and reality. Um, so, you know, we don't define ourselves negatively by saying our philosophy is that there is no God. It's the, the, the rejection of the idea of God is a consequence of affirming reason and affirming facts and evidence that are actually there in reality. Yes, I mean, there, there are things that are true, there are things that are false, they're false and there are things that are arbitrary. That is, that, that have, that there's no basis even to, there's no basis even to, to, check to to try to disprove them because there's nothing that's being presented to it and God falls into the arbitrary. Yes. Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, do, you, do you guys make a distinction between the proof, when you use the word proof and fact, um, I'm, I have a mathematical background, so uh, our, our views on truth and proof and fact uh, I believe are very different than those used in science. Uh, and, you know, due to the large use of probability in science, um, nothing is proven. Nothing can be proven absolutely. Whereas in certain aspects of mathematics, especially assuming, um, you know, Descartes' concept or consciousness uh, can be proven absolutely. Do you, do, you, do you feel that, I guess, you know, with that in mind, atheism, you know, with, with your response, depending, atheism is almost the same kind of belief that people who aren't uh, atheists have. Uh, it's, it's the belief in, you know, something not being there where you really don't have proof of either. And... Uh, it almost seems like atheism, atheism isn't possible uh, because you don't know. Therefore, you would have to be agnostic. Well, I mean, I, I disagree with the claim that science doesn't prove things absolutely. Um, the point is that all knowledge exists within a context. And uh, whenever you prove a scientific claim, you prove it within a particular context of knowledge. The idea that we never have, have some sort of absolute proof rests on, it's essentially it rests on a, on a Platonist view of knowledge that, that you know, the real truth are out there in reality in some other dimension, and anything that we came up with is just an, an approximation to some absolute truth that's out there in another dimension, and we can never actually get there because our consciousness is limited, and so we never actually prove anything. But the point is, there is no other Platonic dimension. And when you talk about something being proven, you're, you, you, you prove a scientific theory by establishing its, its relationship to the facts and evidence. And, you know, it's not, and so, you know, you might respond by saying, well, what if, you know, somebody comes along later and finds that, you know, there are other factors that people didn't know about, and, and it expands the range of validity of the theory, so. Well, like the world's not flat. Well, I mean, people knew in ancient Greece that the world is not flat. So, Sunday. yeah, I mean, it, isn't it? It's really just a, a, like a point of view. I mean, no, because the world is not flat, right? Right, right. No, I mean, now, and that's and is that be proven? Yeah, I believe yeah. now it has been. Well, but is that is that is that a proof not, in the sciences? It's in it's, the sciences, certainly. You know, okay, so some stuff has been proved in the sciences. Right. So. I, you, I, you don't, the, the, I, I mean, think the point is, I think, I think you, you refer to, to, to the problem by, by citing Descartes. I, I think that if you view um, 
science and, and mathematics are somehow detached from realities as deductive uh, processes that we go through, uh, through in our consciousness because that's all that exists, because that's where you start, then you can't get anywhere. Uh, science and well, proof, proof in science is about uh, showing causal relationships within reality and showing that it works in reality and showing that we can explain phenomena in reality. And I think that, of course, things are being proven in reality. They're not proven in a deductive sense, but they are proven in inductive sense. Induction is the way we prove things in reality. So, but that is, that, and that is a legitimate form of proof. Okay. okay. Yeah, my question pertains to that. Uh, the, the metaphysical skepticism that's been promoted by science and mainstream, basically, that all knowledge is provisional and you can't know anything for certain, there are no absolutes. So, I think I've uh, read where Peikoff has said that objectivism needs to formulate a detailed theory of induction do you think that would be helpful in convincing scientists to jump on to uh, metaphysical certainty in that regard? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think it would be helpful. <laughs> First, I think it would be helpful, but I don't think it's, it's, um, it's enough because I think there's enough today <laughs> without, you know, I, I think Leonard has gone a long way to proving, uh, you know, showing the theory of induction, but, that, but even without that, let's say that, that it hasn't been done, uh, even without that, scientists should understand uh, proof and, and, and they engage, you know, uh, uh, Galileo and Newton certainly engaged in induction. And, 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 uh, so I don't think you need to prove that in order to show the efficacy of, of science and to show its metaphysical status. I think that would help, but I think that the skeptics are always going to be skeptics because it's, it's far more fundamental to, the, to their philosophy than you know, just show me one more thing, and, yeah. and then I'll, you know, then I'll, then I'll take, then I'll believe it. There's enough evidence in reality to show what science is and what science isn't that, that I think, uh, that, that I think scientists should be able to see that even without a fully developed theory of induction. Of, uh, induction. Would that be true? Yeah, I mean, I think what, what scientists need is to embrace objectivism in the first place. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. they can defend science properly, and they can defend this assault on science by religious supernaturalism. Well, what you need is a theory of knowledge, and I think Ayn Rand has that. What you need sure. is, is, is reason and the contextual nature of knowledge, and I think Ayn Rand already has that, and that's enough for scientists. And I think a, a, a rational moral co code is something that they're reluctant to accept. You know, it kind of fits in with that. Well, they haven't discovered one. They don't know of one. Mm -hmm. So we need to let Get them the know up. there is one, yeah. <laughs> Uh, my question is not really. This is really going to be the last question because I yeah. made it. You made uh, it. <laughs> my question is not really a question. It's just a series of thoughts that have been popping to my head that haven't really made complete sense. So if you would care enough to comment. Uh, well, the first thing actually is that um, in evolution, since we're having mutations that are uh, improving us as specimens, um, there are also mutations that are negative. The simplest one being, like, you know, bad eyesight or uh, a more extreme example, uh, children that are born with Down syndrome. So I'm thinking, uh, if we are supporting evolution, would we be discouraging the maintenance of negative characteristics? And so therefore, if that popped me into my head, I'm thinking, would that actually be supporting genocide? Which seems to me a really like negative thing, but also sure. it kind of overlays with like sociological obligations and also yeah. ethics. Well, let me, let me stop you there. We're supporting evolution by saying that it's a fact of reality. It's, it's science. We're not supporting, you know. The evolutionary yeah, we're not supporting the evolutionary, we don't, we don't have science saying evolutionary process is great, let's go out and Im impact let's it, go, right? Let's go evolve. <laughs> evolve. You know, <laughs> we're evolving, whether, whether you know, bio, it's, it's a fact of biology, evolution is happening, science identifies it and science is explaining it. I think you do raise an interesting question in the sense that, and, and this is me speculating, and maybe we'll cut this out of the tape. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of once we evolve consciousness and free will uh, and therefore can develop medicine and can develop how to what extent does evolution in its classical sense work on human beings because because you're right in the sense that we don't kill off <laughs> we shouldn't kill off uh, you know the bad those who are born with bad characteristics evolutionary bad eyesight or, or something like that because 
now that we've evolved free will, now that we have reason, it's not that important. What's important is our ability to think, and we have that. So, um, you know, to what extent does evolution work on, on human beings? How, how does it work on human beings? That's, I think that's an interesting question. I, I yeah, don't Yeah, I mean, an one answer. thing you can say on that is, I mean, it's, one thing that evolution does is, 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 is it has a preservative uh, nature. It preserves features that are working well. So, I mean, evolution still does act on us in the sense that if bad mutations come up, you know, uh, you know I, I mean, I think it's true that something like one third of, of conceived embryos don't come to term. And, and, uh, and one explanation for that is that they, the genetic material is not properly, it, it is not um, proper, for life. proper for life. It can't develop. And so, you know, the fact that that's, that occurs is evolution acting on us. The only embryos that come to term are ones that, that have the correct genetic makeup to allow a functioning human being. Yeah, but we do have, you do have, for example, you have uh, you, babies are born with defects Which that would have prevented without them. science sure. they would have died, but now we have science and therefore they can continue living. So right. in that sense, we're preserving that gene that sure. in, you know, in, in, in nature without human beings, without reason, would disappear, maybe. But, but so what? I mean, the beauty of human beings is our capacity for reason and, and the fact that we can do that, and that's wonderful. That's I wonderful. understand. I guess we're, I guess we're my uh, concern. When, but, but don't take anything that we say, anything that's being said, anything that I invented is ever being supported of this kind of eugenics or... Or, or, or this social kind of engineering. social engineering, or, or what um, you know, of where you take the weak and you get rid of them because with no, full I evolution, we're just yeah. going to support. Okay, no, it's just that I guess Good. my hesitance comes from yep. where, uh, with the advancement of science, the preserving of uh, humans, regardless of our fallacies that were born with birth defects, that's kind of like a counteraction of evolution. Is well, but but, but we're even improving of evolution in a sense that once we get into uh, uh, genetic engineering, we'll be able to go in there and actually yeah. set, you know help eliminate diseases and eliminate some weaknesses and actually improve ourselves, improve our eyesight, improve our strength, improve things like that. So in that sense, that, that's wonderful. But yes, we've taken it out of that, you know, the, the uh, e evolution without human consciousness. Yeah, which someday is we will be the product of intelligent design because we will be the intelligent designers. <laughs> that's, that's good. <laughs> Thank you all.